So I worked as a consultant doing uh, essentially financing programs for utilities. Um, and that's been sort of my main role uh, working with utility companies. So that's been on the demand side management or DSM side. So that's like sort of the customer end or the customer interface. Um, so my role has been working between the financial sector and the utility companies to help them develop ways to help their customers, whether they're commercial or residential, finance energy saving improvements. Um, and the goal always is how can we finance these in a way that the customer doesn't pay anything out of pocket and the energy savings pay for the, the debt payments. Um, so that's just kind of been my role, but you know, in doing so, I've gotten a pretty good overview of like how these, how these things operate. But if you see anything that you're like, that's off, that's not exactly correct, uh, feel free to jump in. But I think of utilities as sort of two different sides. There's a the generation side, so they're developing and maintaining power plants um, and the transmission. And then the demand side, which is on, you know, basically on the delivery end, right? There you, you have homes and businesses and cities and universities and things like that, that are the end customers. Um, and so that tends to be two different departments at, at a typical, you know, investor owned utility. Um, utilities are highly regulated. Of course, they're, you know, delivering a necessary at this point product to the home, uh, obviously a lot of opportunity for, uh, you know, monopolies to form. So, so they are regulated. That regulation has really been handed off down to the state level. Um, and the body that regulates utilities is typically called the Public Utility Commission. I think that term is a little bit different, maybe in a few states, but essentially a PUC or Public Utility Commission is um, what regulates and sort of tells the utility what they can and can't do um, in a lot of aspects. That can be bringing on, you know, new generation or new, new plants, uh, what their rates and rate design can be, uh, what their budget and uh, types of like energy efficiency programs or rebates that they're going to offer. All of that goes through a public utility commission. And that uh, typically happens on a two to four year cycle. Um, and that actually is driven, can be driven by you, me, anybody. Anybody with an advocacy or a position that they want to share can, can help push uh, those uh, biannual or, or quadrannual filings uh, in, in one direction or another. So let's say Jack really into uh, storage and he's got you know a particular technology that he wants the utility to consider um, you know, putting a, a rebate towards so that, uh, you know, he can incentivize customers to, to buy this technology. He can go in and make a statement and, you know, submit paperwork and that would be considered um, in, you know, whatever utility filing uh, he's, he's intervening in. Um, so, yeah, interesting that utilities, you know, a rebate essentially for, you know, I can get a more efficient hot water heater at my house uh, for, and I get a rebate from my utility. That's the utility paying me to use less of their product, which obviously seems counterintuitive to a typical business model. Um, it's mostly because they're compelled to do so uh, from a regulatory side. Um, globally, that market is worth 63 billion or more annually. Um, and on the generation side, I didn't get the figure, but, uh, but uh, quite a bit more. Um, and yeah, and then you've got sort of other policy levers that can really affect what a utility is willing to consider and do, uh, such as the clean power plan. Um, obviously, policy is critically important um, in, in pushing new markets uh, anywhere, but particularly, I would say, in this carbon removal world. Um, so what we just sort of talked about regulatory, the other lever and the other sort of way that markets get created is, is, is voluntary markets, right? Um, so utilities know that the products that they deliver, um, and, and everyone knows, are, are, are and have contributed to uh, a significant portion of the carbon in the atmosphere that we now really need to start to draw out. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, utilities are, are aware and they're making various pledges on decarbonizing or uh, becoming you know, carbon neutral in their generation. Um, not, they're not all doing it in a, in a 
one fashion. Uh, it, it's not a level playing field. Everyone's sort of making their own definitions of what you know a 80% reduction by 2050 might mean, uh, for instance. Um, and then the shareholders, you know, for these utilities are typically driving um, those companies to make these these public carbon commitments. So I did pull up. There's um, you know this interesting picture of some of the larger utilities in the U.S. and what uh, what their um, emissions goals have been. Um, so you know, at this point, what I've been talking about mostly has been sort of uh, emissions reductions, um, new basically new carbon. Uh, I think in the carbon removal space, we're also really interested in looking at um, old carbon, right? The carbon that's, that's been spewed into the atmosphere, that, that, that debt that we have. Um, so there's this sort of issue of like decarbonizing versus addressing carbon debt. Um, so I, you know, that, I, I love that term. I love that this is, you know, I want it to be like the 2020 term of the year, of course. It's probably going to be social distancing, um, but uh, yeah. So you know, carbon debt. You know, most notably, Microsoft has said, you know, we're going to address our own carbon debt. What if we could get utilities to start thinking in that way? And it seems largely at this point they really aren't. Um, I did look at one corporate, and I think I linked it in the um, Slack channel. I looked at one. Uh, it was Excel Energy who. I, don't know, I think the eighth largest IOU in the country. Um, they've been a long time client of mine, um, just for full disclosure. And um, yeah, they, they wrote their sort of uh, statement on climate change. And it was really, you know, they, the term carbon removal was actually mentioned 21 times, but the conclusion was it's not market ready. Um, and that was a two year old paper. Um, so I think you could sort of argue whether or not that's potentially the case. I can see why they'd come to that conclusion, but there will come a point where, you know, they're going to rewrite that, um, that public document. And I don't think they're going to be able to um, truthfully say that the carbon removal is, is not market ready. So there will, there will come a point very soon where they're going to be really compelled to, to consider this, uh, consider this suite of technologies and how it relates to, to their business model and for them to achieve their goals. If they're having trouble um, emitting less, um, you know, maybe they're not able to retire some of the gas fired plants that they were hoping to, um, you know, carbon removal might be a, a, another, another way. Um, but you know, to answer sort of my own question here is why haven't utilities adopted or incorporated carbon removal into their strategies? You know, I think there's sort of a three-pronged thing going on. Um, again, it's we're we're in generally considered a, a nascent market here, um, but I don't think that's going to be the case in one or, or two years. I don't think it can, it can be ignored or or just sort of set aside as we're not ready for that. The you know the the carbon removal technologies are not ready. That's that that argument is going to get old very soon if it hasn't already. Um, utilities are not cutting edge businesses, um, so yeah. Um, they're not ready to, you're not going to be on the bleeding edge and, and sort of investing in things that maybe aren't necessarily um, uh, market ready. Um, and that's often because, you know, their, their budgets are made up of ratepayer funds, funds that you and I pay into. So much like a government, uh, what a utility spends their money on um, is pretty highly scrutinized by, by their customers. So they've got to be careful around that. Um, and the fact that utilities have their own ongoing emissions reduction efforts right in front of them. Um, so whether it's looking more at their generation or uh, demand side management, I think that they're really more focused and wrapped up in that. But that sort of brings me to the next point, which is like, okay, um, I think there's still a lot of interesting potential business models there that, that, that could be unpacked. Um, so, you know, where do we see carbon removal technologies intersecting, intersecting with, with utilities who are obviously on some pathway to, to reducing their climate impact um, or, or say differently, like what, what are the technologies or business models that we know of today that maybe seem to integrate best um, with, with either side of, of uh, you know, of the utility world, the demand side or the generation side. Um, I know that there's some 
adoption and, and it's it's very limited. I mean, the one example that really popped up in my head and I Googled around a bit, didn't really find much beyond this is, is uh, and I know you guys talked Bex last week. Um, it's, it's the Drax plant in the UK. So Drax uh, is a uh, ominously named utility in the UK. Um, I don't know why they sound like a, an evil, you know, character in like a Batman movie or something, but um, they, uh, they've now, I think they're operating, I think it's in full operation, you know, a, a, a large uh, generation bioenergy carbon capture and storage facility. Um, so, I mean, that's, that is something interesting that certainly is carbon removal. Um, I think there's a number of others that are to be, you know, being considered those types of plants, I know take a long time to permit, um, long time to develop. And again, that's, um, this is one utility that's sort of on that leading or, or bleeding edge, which, um, is maybe more unusual for, for this, for this market. Um, some other ideas on synergies, and then I'm going to kind of open it up. I'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Um, you know, there's continuing with, with the Bex uh, plant idea. Um, I think siting is, is obviously very important. You have to, in my mind, from what, from what I understand, you have to have feedstocks as well as uh, either a pipeline to or, or a, you know, underground storage facility sort of all co-sited for that really to, to make sense. Um, but you can do that in sort of on a, on a distributed generation or, or smaller scale um, with biomass reactors uh, and enhanced capture technology. Um, those things do exist. Um, a lot of talk around that in some of the, the biochar world. Um, and utilities are, are at this point much more open to and interested in, in um, what they call DG or distributed generation. That's really been pushed by the solar market. Um, and made more viable and ever more possible uh, and scalable by the you know, increasing storage market and the you know, increasing viability and cost effectiveness of, of storage. Um, uh, another idea is, is flue gas capture, utilizing new MOF technologies. Um, and we love, we love the MOF technologies. Um, so that's sort of you know, something to consider on the generation side. Large scale solar, um, you know, to, to power uh, direct air capture. Um, so that's something that we've talked about in this group before. Um, whether utilities would play a part in that or not, I don't have the answer. I don't know if we have examples to date and we know if there is a utility involved, but really there doesn't necessarily have to be transmission coming out of that. It could be, you know, we're, they're using the power that they produce right there purely to, to run the, uh, the direct air capture. Um, and then, you know, Jack's got a company, Red Carbon. Um, I think there's some interesting potential crossovers uh, onto, uh, you know, with energy storage and um, clearly. So, you know, I'm curious to hear what his thoughts might be. Um, something I, I, I would assume he's spent some time considering at this point. Um, so, yeah, and then just another concept more on the customer side would be HVAC. Um, I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago where, uh, you know, if we can get um, sort of like uh, open air collective, you know, these smaller modular direct air capture uh, systems created, um, and then someone would, you know, measure what gets pulled out of the air as far as carbon uh, and, and paying, you know, paying the, the equipment owner or the, which would essentially be the built, building owner um, to run that machine, um, that's an interesting model because you know, there's a lot of built, a lot of space uh, to be heated and cooled in the built environment. Um, a lot of machines running all day, every day that are already sucking in and blowing out air. Um, so there, there is some interesting synergies there to sort of piggyback direct air capture technology into HVAC, which is really ubiquitous in the built environment. Um, and again, I, I maybe. Uh, Christian, I think Christian's on, um, might know a little bit more about, you know, what, uh, what Open Air Collective, uh, if, if anything, has been considering in, uh, in, in that space. So talked at you guys a bit. Um, uh, I'm curious, maybe I'll just kind of throw out, like, 
anything that I anything that I missed here? Any ideas that either came up you had sort of came into the meeting with or that you thought of while I was talking? Um, anything that I might have missed that like, well, it would be interesting if this and this happened, or I know of this company that is working with this utility. Yeah, I would say a couple things when you were talking, Jeremy, that came up. So I was thinking about core competencies of utilities and like what they're good at. And at least in the case of vertically integrated utilities, I was thinking about how what they do is basically build this infrastructure to transmit things and handle the operations of these really large complex plants. And there's like a lot of overlap with that skill and building direct air capture and CO2 transportation infrastructure. And so that's like that's a, a kind of higher level synergy um, that I was thinking of. And then also I was so, thinking of- So those. Grant, that would be like pi pipelines just to, to move CO2 around maybe to storage facilities. Is that is that kind of the example you were thinking? Similar, yeah. I mean, I guess a lot of utilities might not do that. I mean, there's more like upstream natural gas and oil companies that maybe focus on the pipeline specific side that would, yeah. one can make an argument, those have a better or those would those types of companies would be more competent. They would be the ones actually building this. But I am thinking about power lines too. And if we build out this carbon capture and utilization economy and the circular economy of carbon and all that kind of stuff, and there's actually a lot of demand from a lot of different sectors for CO two, um, there will be demand for transporting that stuff. I mean, some of it you can take by truck, but it might be easier if we have pipelines. And so that could be a place where utilities could play a role, given that they just have the experience and skill managing infrastructure that transmits electricity. Um, so, and then so of course, me, they're also a source of CO2 that they can monetize with this infrastructure. Let me, let me challenge you on that to go like a, a step further and, and, and bigger here. So utility essentially is just a, you know, a company that delivers a product to the end user. Like it could be a water utility, it could be gas, could be electricity. Um, and there's a number of different things. Maybe, do we see a point where there could be a, a carbon utility? Is it, is it a product that can be commoditized in a way that's similar to say water, gas, or electricity to the point where, you know, you have various point sources and you need to manage the flow to the, to the end users. And, uh, you know, you would have at some future date, a, a carbon utility. I think that could make sense. And if that number that, there was a number floating around a little while ago that um, the whole carbon capture and utilization industry could be worth a trillion dollars by 2030. I don't know how much hardcore market research went into that, but it was from this early report, I think from CO2 Sciences. And if that's true, if it really is, or could be this trillion dollar industry, certainly it seems like we would need a CO2 utility or companies that essentially function as, as one. Uh, let, me, let me jump in here as well, real quick, because uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this and I'll, hold them for later and let Grant finish, but I wanna make a point on this particular topic. I think there's co-location opportunities all over the place here. Uh, DAC requires power. Sequestration requires power. Utilities require alternate revenue streams, which DAC could be. Heliogen is uh, looking to add DAC on top of their power facilities, right? So the opportunity of a crossover or a co-location also solves your distribution problem. If you co-locate DAC at scale with power at scale, with sequestration at scale, you don't have to distribute the carbon all over the place, which lowers your cost. There's a huge opportunity for co-location here and the pieces are starting to kind of come together and you see some of the earlier uh, advanced companies playing around with the edges, maybe doing two pieces of the three. But I think the opportunity to combine all three pieces is is absolutely on the horizon. Go ahead, Grant. Sorry, I just wanted to make that point. No, I think that makes that makes sense. You know, cause we'll have the carbon from direct air capture, which we could co-locate at facilities that might need it. Um, but it could also be the case that for the point source capture too, um, that that can be monetized maybe by the utility companies or other companies too. I mean, I know we're talking about utilities, but any point source of CO2 seems like it could have that opportunity to capture that carbon. And then, uh, you know, this is interesting too, uh, Jeremy, I like the idea of the carbon utility because that might almost take some hassle away. So 
if you are a steel mill and you emit a lot of CO2 and then capture it, you're not really also in the business of trying to monetize that CO2. I mean, your job is manufacturing and selling steel um, and, and all of the things that go along with that. It's not selling carbon. So the carbon utility could almost act as like the facilitator of a marketplace or something where they would buy captured carbon from when it's captured at these point source locations uh, for whatever the market price is. And then they sell it for some premium to someone else who might need it for something. So I, I think there's, there's something here. And then, yeah, it, then there's also the co-location with DAP, which just seems like an opportunity too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those sort of transmission pipelines and, and pathways are, you know, notoriously difficult to, to permit for. Um, but you know, the, the strategy is always to, to co-locate. So if there's a pipeline, whether it's carrying, you know, water or, um, or gas or whatever, um, you know, co-locating a, 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 a CO2 pipeline along that is, is always going to be a, an easier task than, than finding a, a new route, you know, hundreds of miles across, you know, all sorts of different land uses. Um, that's, that's super interesting. A, a, a CO2 utility, um, really just sort of facilitating the movement of, you know, mining, a, mining a product, or you know, in this case, sort of facilitating someone's waste product to, uh, the place where, uh, it's actually got some, some economic value. Um, that's, that is super interesting. Um, what else? Anyone have uh, any other like just ideas that, that popped into their head about this space as we were as we were talking? J John, anything come to you? Yeah, I was thinking about curtailment from renewable energy sources and as a possible um, also sort of co-production sort of thing because like people in the power generation business are always talking about how like uh, for solar, for example, like. There, there's power being just curtailed and like given for negative money that just gets wasted and putting that into some sort of you know co-located DAC plant or somehow utilizing that power for carbon removal could be like a way to actually get paid for this because they're paying you to take that take that power generation interesting uh, I'll, I'll add something there. Yeah, as well. I was going to ask Jack from the from a storage angle. What, what do you think about that? Because is that sort of an issue that maybe is going to be less so now? You know, given where we are globally with with energy storage. Uh, less so. Uh, let me let me let me say something real quick about John's comment first, and then I'll talk about the, some of the storage stuff that I see uh, in crossover with uh, negative carbon. But waste heat, I've talked a lot with uh, Carlos about this. Carlos has been on this channel a few times. Uh, from an engineering mind standpoint, I mean, he's one of the smartest guys on the planet. And he identifies a lot of waste heat and a lot of waste energy, uh, whether it's from renewables and the cyclicality of the renewable intermittency cycles, or if it's just waste industrial heat, right? There's, again, it's about co-location. There's waste heat all over the place. And if you apply some of that waste heat, to DAC or to uh, CO2 to C processes or wherever you think you need energy in order to facilitate the negative carbon economy. There are sources of it just with the waste that's out there, whether it's renewables or industrial plants or utilities. So when you look at the utility market, I think you see what their needs are. And one of those is additional revenue streams. And if you're looking at additional revenue streams, uh, DAC and or turning some of their waste heat or waste electricity or excess intermittent electricity that they're just tossing in a bucket, uh, turn it into something valuable. I mean, that's that's solving a problem for them. So um, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Again, Carlos and I have talked about that. On the storage side, uh, yeah, I, I mean, intermittency is a huge problem. I mean, if you look at the markets that are absolutely exploding right now globally, one of them, uh, one of the leading ones is grid scale batteries and the electric electrification of the grid. So if you're looking at killing two birds with one stone, the idea of capturing carbon from the atmosphere and storing that carbon, whether it's injection or carbon blocks, which I envision or whatever, uh, that's a revenue source potentially for the utilities, potentially with some waste generated heat, heat on site. But then the battery component 
is something where you can convert that energy into batteries or even have those batteries made out of carbon or carbon dioxide or carbon composites. I know that MIT was playing around with a carbon dioxide battery uh, and the idea of batteries made out of carbon or carbon dioxide, both interesting. The idea of doing that on a grid scale, very interesting because then the co-location play comes into the mix and all of a sudden you're talking about uh, synergies between industrial production of stuff, waste, heat, waste, energy, um, uh, utilities, uh, power generation, DAC, all of it can happen on one site. I think this co-location idea is something I have been playing around with. Red Carbon's business model is use and sequester carbon simultaneously so we get paid twice and we do it by building carbon blocks made out of composite plugging them into the grid and turning them into grid scale batteries. Uh, that, that happens most efficiently on site with a utility. And it happens most efficiently when you don't have to distribute the carbon or carbon dioxide all over the place, you can do it all on one site. So then it's, you know, a heliogen energy source providing power to the utility through their concentrated solar arrays. And then that also providing power to the DAC that's, mounted on top of the heliogen tower made out of zeolite moffic materials and yeah it's just i'm rambling but i think the co-location potential here is it's kind of obvious and kind of profound if you want to achieve rapid scale which red carbon is focused on i think that's a low-hanging fruit you had any discussions jack with with utilities or, or folks who work in utilities not yet but I expect to be ramping that up soon. Expect you will, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I expect, expect there'll be there'll be interest. I mean, again, going back to utility needs, I mean, if you're thinking about what they need, uh, they need additional revenue sources. They're, they're gonna have, uh, today it's a need, tomorrow it might be a mandate, right? I mean, uh, low carbon decarbonized power generation whether it's electrification or decreasing the fossil fuel uh, component or offsets or whatever. I mean, right now it's, it's, a, it's a wanna have uh, 10 years from now or five years from now, depending on policy, it might be a must have. So all of a sudden utilities are gonna be calling DAC companies and saying, hey, how can you help me decarbonize or offset my carbon footprint? So. Right now we're calling them thinking about ways to help them in the future. They might be calling us saying, hey, we got to do this, help me figure this out. So there's certainly opportunities there. I agree. I expect they will. And I think anyone who can sort of get ahead of that curve and skate to where that puck might be, uh, might set themselves up to to really be in a, in a great place. Um, I don't yeah, know if I agree. it's three years down the road, seven years, 10 years, but but I would say a, a decade at most when exactly what Jack just described will start happening. The utilities are going to start getting wise to this and saying, well, who do we call? Who do we know that, that can do this? And, and hey, can you, uh, you help us pull some carbon out that, that we need to, we can't do on our own. Well, one final thought and then I'll be quiet because I, I have a tendency to ramble. Um, I've heard over the course of uh, the air miners community and the slack over the last couple of months, a couple of smart guys, I'm going to mention them by name. They probably don't appreciate this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Marcus from Hertz, who's one of the leading uh, Santo angel guys. I mean, he was president for a while and he wrote a piece that was published on this channel and he's actually a member of air miners and he was part of the networking discussion a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, he, he suggested that fo focusing on the customer is really important as part of what we're doing. And that's always important for any startup, but I think more so for what we're doing. Um, customers, corporate customers all over the place are in the process right now of figuring out how to decarbonize their supply chain, how to decarbonize their product, how to decarbonize their partners. Um, how to add value in this space. I mean, it's the wild west, it's a new frontier and everybody's trying to figure it out. So the opportunity for smaller early stage companies is profound because the bigger guys don't have the advantage they normally do. 
sometimes the smaller nimble guys I, in a new market can get there faster, right? And it, it, if it's a new market and everybody's coming up with ideas, uh, the, the guys in the big companies are just thinking the same stuff the guys in the smaller companies are thinking. So if you're faster and you can get there first and you're thoughtful about how you present yourself to customers and where their needs are, uh, the focus on the customer is critical and it'll give you an advantage. Uh, another person that mentioned that focus was uh, Brett Gentry in one of the networking groups talked about focusing on customers and they're both right. And uh, yeah. Is that really like just put, like the fact that you have to solve the problem is that, is that really that the customer focus is, well, you always have to answer the question, what problem are you solving? And the, the, the customer could be, it could be a, a massive utility, right? They've got, they've got problems all day long. And quite frankly, I know that utilities outsource, you know, a lot of what they do, um, you know, maybe. Like, like you said earlier, Jeremy, about, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Grant, you said it earlier about steel companies. Uh, they're not experts in this CDR thing, right? So they may call up a carbon utility and say, hey, help me figure out how to decarbonize my world. I'm not an expert, but I'll pay you guys to help me figure out how to do this. Yeah, I mean, that's going to happen all over the place in this space. And the fact that it's a new space or an emerging space, relatively new, uh, gives younger, earlier, smaller companies a more even footing. The big guys haven't carved out their, their territory yet. Uh, it's still happening now. So more opportunities for us smaller folks. Yeah, well, and this conversation too is making me think that there's opportunity for us personally, like I'm thinking of the people in this group. So Jeremy, I know you're a consultant and John and Christian, I know you guys are also students. Um, and it seems like there's opportunities for some sort of carbon removal consultancy that works with utility companies to come up with business plans to implement this stuff. And I, I just Googled that to see if I could find anything. And I couldn't really. It seems like there's a lot of consultant consultants, like three, de, de, three degrees who will do stuff with renewable energy and energy efficiency. And then Nori came up uh, on my search and bear in mind, I didn't really, really dig in. This was a quick Google search. But I really wonder is, you know, could there be potential for like a carbon removal consultants and by virtue of us all, you know, being in the field and, and being exposed to a lot of this stuff, might people like us be primed? And when I say people like us, I'm talking about people in air miners generally. There could be potential if we're thinking of like more immediate things for, I mean, I could really imagine it, uh, carbon removal consultancy that works with utility companies to figure out, okay, how can you decarbonize? And, and, that, and, that, or, and how can you implement carbon removal in particular? And it seems like it's not just about monetizing the CO2, but like we're talking about in terms of regulation, just as there are renewable portfolio standards, there could very well just be like uh, carbon neutral or carbon negative portfolio standards in the future, mm -hmm. maybe applied on a state-by-state -state basis. And if the utility has to meet that, but they're like, wow, we don't know how, we don't have the time to build the in-house team to do it they could go to this kind of carbon removal consultancy that could itself be building relationships with people who sell um, director capture units, people who sell point source capture units, it partnered, maybe the consultancy partners with the carbon utility and, and they figure that out too. So it seems like there could be a potential for that. It's a, a, little, a little separate. And just one last thing too, I know that uh, the Global CO2 Initiative where I work is working with some utility companies to begin to investigate these things and because some of the goals like DTE which is my utility company they have a I think according to the map before it's by 2040 or 2050 they want to be carbon neutral uh, but that's with like I think 40 percent natural gas and so it's like well they're going to need some sort of capture or some sort of offsetting system and they're going to need uh, a lot of advice on, on how to make that happen. Yeah. Also, check out uh, Duke Energy. I think they announced that they're going 100% renewable. So uh, it's already starting. Jennifer, uh, Jeremy spoke about the, the shift and yeah. the fact that it's, it's underway and it's happening. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's beyond starting because Duke's not committed to 100% and the and I, and others are in the 70, 80, 90% range. Yeah. I, I believe that Duke is also the highest emitting single utility in the United States as well. Yeah, no, it, it, it's an interesting mm -hmm. uh, two-sided coin for sure, but their commitment is notable. 
they're, they've got a strong presence in, in coal country and uh, have made use of those resources in their generation assets. Uh, but yeah, they're on this, um, I think you guys can still see my screen, they're, they're, they're on this slide, net zero by 2050. And these, uh, I'll just go off on a brief tangent, these dates are so fucking out of touch to me uh, with, with science that I, I, I suspect and I greatly hope that these will, uh, these will be revised once that becomes um, obvious uh, to, to everyone, just, you know, how, how out of step, you know, doing anything by 2050 at this point uh, is, is with, the, with the existing science. So, um, yeah, I, I, I might suspect you'll see revisions on these where once, you know, 90% by 2045 might have been cutting edge, um, you know, we're, we're, the public will start to point out um, you know, starting with, with specialists and pundits, that, that that's, that is just out of step. Um, and those, those, these, these goals, I suspect, will be revised. Yeah, we're going to have to get there faster. And I think the, the policy and the, the mind share are, when they shift, they're going to shift rapidly. I remember reading a book, uh, I shared this the other day with somebody in the Slack, I was having a direct message. I remember reading a book 30 years ago about business stuff written by Andrew Grove. Write this down, guys. Uh, he was the chairman of Intel for a while, and he wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And again, it was a business book, but the first hundred pages he talks about back in the 80s, how was, there was this 10x shift in their business. They didn't make microprocessors at the time. They made these other chips, and they saw Microsoft coming, and they realized there was an entirely new business model emerging that was going to completely replace their business model. So they upended their entire company, completely changed their business model and their business focus, and then weathered the storm and ended up on the back end of it, controlling the microprocessor market for PCs for decades, right? But a lot of the other bigger mainframe type companies, they got squeezed out and they're no longer in business, right? They didn't shift fast enough. And this guy's points about this 10x shift and being able to recognize it when it's coming is critical to strategic business success. Ah, that's where we're at right now, except this isn't a business thing. This is a, you know, our, our world thing. And it's also not a 10x shift. It's like a 100x shift. So it's going to happen. And when it does, it happens very quickly. And this isn't new. This is something that's been going on for a long time in smaller chunks. Uh, and being able to recognize it when it's coming and getting ready for it is, that's the game we're in right now. So everybody on Air Miners is ahead of that curve, just the fact that you're here. Um, yeah. But recognizing the, the moment is, is really important. One other thought, um, Grant mentioned trillion dollar opportunity. Um, Bill Gross mentioned it when he was talking about Heliogen, uh, saying this wasn't just a trillion dollar opportunity. And I agree with what he said. He said, this is the biggest business opportunity in human history. And I agree with him. That's sinking. Yeah, I agree with him. Here's why. This is the biggest problem in human history. And those aren't my words. Those are scientists' words, and they're a lot smarter than I am. This is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. And put that in context, right? I mean, really think about it. This isn't the biggest challenge the Romans have ever faced or the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Macedonians or, you know, our oldest caveman ancestors. This isn't their biggest challenge. This is the biggest challenge of all of them put together, and it's on us. So, so we got to hurt that. that in your yeah. pipe and smoke it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> I have to hop off in 10 minutes to go to another meeting, but I wanted to jump in real quick and just say a couple of things. So first, to address your question about the Open Air Collective, Jeremy, they don't really have a target customer in mind because they're an open source like volunteer network. So what their idea is like, we just will create the first version and then we'll crowdsource it and other people will iterate on that. They're thinking like initial uses are like for greenhouses or um, smaller scale stuff like that. And I'm a little concerned because we're using a moisture swing absorption process and I, there's problems with that um, as you scale and so they were like all right maybe we can look into other 
uh, swing absorption technologies later on. Um, but right now we're going to focus on this because that's what they, they have access to a sorbent that does that and they're a small group. And so they're, they're going with that for now. Um, so that's just a little bit about open air. And then the second thing is I came across a company called net power. Have you guys heard of them? Okay. Okay. Grant has They're basically, it's like kind of, competing i guess like maybe it's counter to like carbon removal they're basically burning natural gas with pure oxygen and generating uh high pressure co2 to turn a turbine and then they're recycling that co2 continuously and then any of that excess co2 is then yeah that's that's the company right there that jeremy just pulled up but they aren't capturing any co2 but their whole thing is just no emissions at all but they're still using natural gas um so i was curious as to like how because they they seem very counter to like what we're trying to do with removing co2 but at the same time they're not releasing anything to the atmosphere they're just recycling it but they're still continuing that dependency on natural gas um so i'm curious to what you all think about that christian i don't know um i don't know what specifically the technology is here well like if there's a certain type of engine that they're developing that is essentially like 99 you, yeah if you go to here, let me put the link in, and if you scroll down, it shows a really nice uh, block flow what diagram. I was going to say I'm 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 under um, an NDA with another company that that is developing what I would describe as you know what a genset engine is. Essentially, it is a it's an engine that burns at a, a consistent roughly like 1500 degrees Celsius and burns everything, even VOCs and particular matter. So there's you know the parts per million of anything that comes out of it is like below 20. Huh. Um, and so you can really feed it anything um, that has carbon in it. Uh, but, you know, they're considering, you know, natural gas or, you know, other even dirtier fuels because it's so efficient in, in burning those fuels up. And there's some really interesting applications for that type of technology, which might be similar to this um, in a utility. Say, I'm sorry. I, I, let me also say two things on that. Um, Methane to CO2 is interesting, and here's why. Again, if you're trying to solve the problem, the short-term warming potential of methane is, uh, per the IPCC over like 20 years, it's 80, 84, so 84 times more than CO2. But over the course of uh, 10 years, it's like 130 or 140 times, which you can't find in the published literature. Um, over 100 years, it's like 28 times for the IPCC. But it doesn't live that long in the atmosphere. It's only up there for 10 to 15 years. So the warming potential of methane over a short period of time, if there's a, a regular repeated source, like there will be in the, you know, Siberian permafrost and that kind of stuff once it gets going, being able to take methane out and replace it with CO2 decreases your overall warming potential, right? So that's helpful from a climate warming standpoint. The other thing that's interesting is a lot of financial models are being built around taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you can take methane and convert it to CO2, you get paid for the CO2 sequestration and the methane's largely free, right? So there, there's something to be said, and I, I'm not justifying or validating the business model, uh, but I am saying taking methane and turning it into CO2 sounds like a financially winner uh, financial yeah, yeah, yeah. Fin financially a good idea, but also I think it helps the the lower the warming potential of the methane over a short period of time, which is important. Agreed. I yeah. think there might be a company doing that in Canada and the U.S. called Questor. I'm not yeah. sure if, if you've heard of them, but yeah, they just do very clean and efficient burns of methane, converting it to CO2. Yeah, there's uh, a few companies playing around with it, and I hadn't heard of Questor, but yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. It's an interesting model. Yeah, just without the without the B at the end. <laughs> so new they have the Questor or Dungeon. <laughs> yeah, so new, so new they don't show up on the top ten on Google. <laughs> they are uh, publicly listed, so they're they're a fairly large company. Um, yeah, maybe I, put in technologies at the end. That might do it. I do think these clean burning 
um, you know, sort of more more modular, distributed um, resource type of, of uh, technologies are probably really interesting to utilities. Um, yeah. and, and it seems like these technologies are haven't quite hit the scale that they need to, but utilities seem like a great a great uh, sort of coattail to ride to, to, to get to scale. If, if yeah, I were. no, I, I think there's a huge opportunity for our small companies to piggyback or partner with utilities because again, they're looking for answers right now. And if you got a good answer, uh, even if you're not there yet, uh, they got money and resources. I mean, they can be your partner slash incubator and help you scale. So mm -hmm. um, rather than go the incubator VC route, you could go to the utilities and say, hey, make me your partner, give me a little bit of grant money and access to your labs and your research scientists. And they'll, they'll consider that seriously. So, yeah. Well, I will tell you, I, uh, maybe it was Grant was saying, you know, there's <laughs> a, a big opportunity here for, um, for consultants and you know I'm I, being one of them I, I, I fully recognize that um, maybe um, I'm a little ahead of the curve and but I, I do anticipate or at least I'm trying to position myself as you know enough of a carbon removal expert that uh, you know I can use my utility connections at some point in the future to you know help them um, with exactly what, what, what Grant was describing sort of how do they get involved in this world what are their options um, how do they use it to to meet their their goals um, I think there's also, you know, when you have any of these distributed energy resource technologies and you're trying to move energy around on a dynamic grid basis, you have software uh, or requisite software that, that can sort of respond to generate it over here, need energy over here. I mean, you, you got to move that energy around efficiently. Um, so there's a ton of software companies that I've seen being developed and, and I'm sure plenty more opportunities if you were to go a new direction and say a you know a, a, a carbon utility um, there's, there's probably just billions of, of lines of code to write there to um, support that uh, technology and, and, and uh, efficiently move move those resources around on, on whatever grid you're looking at so just sort of an interesting you know additional uh, market to look at with with any of this. Um, guys, I know we, we do have some more time. I actually have to jump off and interview someone. Um, so I'm not going to be able to stay. Um, I got to jump off in, in two minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, the line will be open. and um, I'll keep it open, Jeremy. It's all good. I'll hold the fort. All right. Um, yeah, anything, anything else? Anything someone didn't get to share? thought that uh, anyone wanted to, to leave us with. Uh, hopefully this was interesting. I really enjoyed this format and i um, excited to, to continue with it. Uh, Christian, I'm going to reach out to you as well since you seem to have some inroads with uh, Open Air Collective. Um, I think maybe looking at their model along with uh, Project Vesta, um, who's also, from what I understand, kind of looking at more of an open source, like they're, they're, they're a nonprofit. Um, and kind of weighing uh, pros and cons of, of that model versus, you know, we're in this to create intellectual property and to make money. And, you know, does that drive faster innovation than saying this is available to everybody, but, um, you know, the, maybe the, the money isn't, isn't there. Uh, I know that to me, that's an interesting thing to, to consider is how do you actually structure these businesses for, for maximum speed and, and, and rapid scaling? Jeremy, check out Professor Dittmar. Okay. Um, he's doing distributed HVAC stuff. Uh, and they use the captured CO2 for circular fuel. And Very it's an open kind of model as well. Put that on your list. I will. It's an interesting well, podcast on Dory. You can find him on there. Cool. Very good. Um, thanks, guys. That was great. If you enjoyed it, maybe um, it would be awesome if you could, in the Slack channel, just, you know, say thumbs up to this last thing or they enjoyed it. Or, you know, if you have some suggestions on, you know, a, a different way we could uh, present information, uh, we just want to get better and, and be entertaining and, and uh, hopefully spur on some, uh, you know, help people to flex those entrepreneurial muscles and, and start thinking around different uh, different ways to to make businesses and, and make markets in this space so 
Um, yeah, I, I would love anyone's uh, ability to just take a moment and uh, put some comments in the channel. Hopefully that'll attract some, some more folks and uh, we'd love to, to build this up a little bit. Sounds good. Awesome. See you guys later. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Jeremy. See you, Christian. All right, guys. I'm going to go to. See you, Grant. Bye, Grant. We'll see you next week. All right. Thank you, both. Thanks for joining, Roger. I'll be in touch. Yeah, yeah no, sounds good. Bye. You guys going to stay? You going to stay? You, you got to go? Uh, let me leave you with a thought, and then I'll let you go. Sure. Um, there's something to be said about uh, utilities um, emitting, right? Um, when you look at the, the global contribution to carbon emissions annually, what is it, 40 gigaton a year, something like that? Uh, even if you put a lid on all of it tomorrow, which would, let, let's call that the flu stack lid, right? I mean, there, I posted a link in the, I think the general channel today, this morning about uh, new MOF technology emerging out of Cal Berkeley uh, in combination with ExxonMobil and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. But it's based on a flu stack DAC process. And even if that were deployed globally on every flu stack globally, uh, that means the 40 gigaton a year starts to come down, right? Yep. That doesn't do anything about what's already up there. Right, of course. And what's already up there it, today is already warming today. So although I appreciate the, the flu stack business model because all those guys got to figure out how to cap the put a lid on their smokestacks right and uh, reduce their emissions so there's a business model there because they all have lots of money and they'll pay people to help them figure that out it doesn't necessarily solve our problem so if you're trying to make money and you're trying to make a business model yeah go the flu stack route because it's also easier to capture carbon sure yeah. from a flu stack because it's more concentrated right but if you're trying to solve the problem of too much atmospheric carbon Putting a lid on a flu stack really doesn't matter. Yeah. Just, just a thought. It, Jeremy mentioned his pet peeve. Uh, that's, that's my pet peeve. Makes sense. Yeah. No, you, you got to get rid right of the, the pre-existing stuff. I yeah. think, yeah, there's more risk there, right? I mean, if we, if we decarbonize our entire economy, economy and do it well globally over the next 20 or 30 years, but we leave what's up there up there, Ah, the risk that we start to bump into self-reinforcing feedbacks and tipping points and all that stuff, I mean, that's very real risk, right? Yeah. However, if we go the other way and take what's up there and bring it down, and yeah. it buys us more time to decarbonize our economy, right? So it seems like the better answer. Yeah, um, I mean... That's, that's also both. a pet, pet peeve of mine because everybody seems to be focused on decarbonizing our economy instead of just taken out of the atmosphere what's up there and the problem is it's the harder problem that doesn't mean it's not the more important one it just means it's the harder one yeah yeah no it's tough that's a good point though it's uh, every a lot of people seem to prioritize the decarbonization part but it's worth challenging that assumption i guess yeah that, that, that's what i'm trying to do it's hard to hard to do that because a lot of people are really committed to this decarbonization movement and yeah. i don't want to tell them not to be because it's, it also needs done, right? Sure. But if you're looking at the two as separate problems instead of one problem, right? Two buckets. Yeah. One of those buckets is a lot more important to solve a lot faster than the other bucket. At scale too. At not scale. A, yeah. Not so, a, yeah, it's basically prioritizing the harder problem. You know, when you're going through your to-do list, you always knock off easy stuff first. Yep. And then the big ones, they always stay at the bottom of your to-do list. They're always there. They never leave. Right. Um, we need to put them at the top and just start gnawing at a couple of these bigger ones. Otherwise, uh, decarbonizing our economy in 30 years really won't matter. Sure, yeah. That makes sense. I had two thoughts that are unrelated, but that I thought I should get off my chest at least and start yeah, thinking. Yeah, sure, please. Um, the first one is I've been thinking about like 
Um, this is sort of only vaguely related to utilities, but I guess just viewing them as a broad group of customers. Um, like, how do you, like, yeah, from, from a purely business side, how do different carbon removal companies get like brand differentiation? How, do, how does it become like a differentiated product uh, that's actually sold? Whereas the, the carbon utility company or the, not the, the regular utility company is actually um, like the, they're choosing the best one. They're choosing who can provide the most negative emissions. Like what actually differentiates at scale once these technologies are legit and there are a lot of companies doing it? What, why would it? Why would a company choose? Why would a utility choose one company over the other? Um, you want me to answer that? <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's just yeah, a broad, no. I, it's a, it's a great question. I think I think um, I think efficiency is is going to end up being a critical part of it. The other part is frankly just going to be ah, who's who's the better connected business person, right? It's kind of like uh, Blu-ray versus the other one, right? I mean, there were two competing techniques at one time and Blu-ray won out, even though the other one was supposed to be better. And I think it's, uh, you go to uh, Betamax, remember Betamax? There was an old fight between uh, tape, tape cassettes and these, they were the boxes that you would just slide into a, a, a hole and it would read it. So tape versus Betamax. And it was two different competing technologies, but they were mediums for how you stored your videos. Sure. Um, the one that was better technology lost. Uh, the one that won was the one that was branding and marketing and figuring out how to get in yeah. bed with the people who dictated uh, the scale in that market. So a lot of it's business focused, but I think from a technology, so I can answer it two different ways. Yeah. The technology standpoint, I think it's efficiency. Um, if your DAC material is more efficient than the other guy's DAC material, then people are going to want to use yours because it's lower cost, right? Well, yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say like, it, it, it becomes ahead. like a perfect competition market at some point. Like, if everybody's selling the same like carbon credits and it's purely a matter of cost is differentiating then like whoever it's just like the current energy market where like the the grid basically just pays whoever can do it cheapest to, to pull those um or not the grid whoever whoever's buying just pays whoever can do it for cheapest and most efficient yeah like nori let's say they control the marketplace right so do they right now they're selling uh soil carbon credits mm -hmm. Ah, but in the future, maybe some DAC machine produces those soil carbon credits cheaper. I'm right. sorry, produces those carbon credits cheaper than the soil guys, right? So then yeah. Nori would be incentive because they're making their money on the margin. They'd be incented to go with the, the DAC guy and they'll throw away their soil focus. Their farmers, yeah. And then it's just a market. Yeah, then it's bottom dollar. But it's also about the business models, right? So when you're thinking about utilities and them controlling the energy in the, in the country, right? How you get, get in with those guys and say, well, I want to scale DAC. By getting in with the energy guys and co-locating with the energy guys, it gives you an advantage because you're in there. It also gives you an advantage if you want to sequester the carbon because you're on site. If you can sequester it on site, Ah, then you're co-locating and you don't need to distribute, which lowers your costs. Yeah. So uh, part of it's the business model, part of it's positioning, Connections. Part of it's how the market evolves, part of it's technology. It's it's a good question, but there's there's no easy answer. For sure. Yeah, it's interesting. No, it's a good it's a got a good thought exercise. Post that in the Slack and I'll bet you'll get a whole bunch of people wanting to talk about it. Yeah, sure, I will. I'll, uh, I'll help tease it along. Awesome. Yeah, and then the other thing is we were talking about like carbon utilities, which is sort of the flip side. Like as far as I know, utilities are like regulated monopolies basically where it's like right. certainly not um, like a bunch of small guys maneuvering in the space trying to get there as fast as possible. All of a sudden, like the carbon utility becomes the structured conservative organ or like regulatory body basically that like sort of 
in the case of carbon, like drains the space or makes it less agile, I'd say. Um, so oh, I, agree. I, I agree with you. Um, I don't like the idea of a carbon utility uh, for the same reasons you don't like it. Um, I can tell you this, um, the oil and gas fossil fuel guys, they're trying to control this process for sequestration. Uh, and they're trying to, to use their money to help control the process for sequestration. Yeah. But based on what I've seen and what I've shared on the Slack, their process doesn't scale and it certainly doesn't scale rapidly. And there was a video floating around from an MIT professor. I think I posted it on this channel even uh, from Dr. Juanes, J-U-A-N-E-S. And in a very short five minute video, uh, I'll repost it. If not, just, just check it out. I'll repost it. because okay. it, it may be buried in a thread somewhere. But it's worthwhile to watch those five minutes because in those five minutes, he comes to the conclusion. And he's, he's speaking to a pro uh, sequestration of fossil fuel, super critical injection, liquid, all that stuff. I mean, these are pro that market. And he says to them, look, guys, how <laughs> ah, this technology, it just, here's what we're up against. And he goes through the math and says, this is an interim bridge solution, his term, bridge, to other solutions that are going to be more efficient and that will scale because this will not scale. And he uses uh, an, uh, a math where he starts with a number and backs into another number and he's doing barrels per day and sure. what are their injection rates and all this kind of stuff. Very fossil fuel metric -y type thing. But his conclusion was this, 125 million barrels per day injected, two kilometers underground, 125 million barrels per day. A barrel is 42 gallons. So when you do it in gallons, it's in the trillions. And that 125 million barrels a day is the equivalent of sequestering 3.7 gigatons, which is only 1 11th of what we're putting up there. So you have to multiply 25 million times 42 times 11. And it comes up to, uh, in barrels, 1.35 I'm sorry, 1.375 trillion barrels, which ah, in gallons, it's like 55 trillion gallons per day. Yeah. Sequester just what we're putting up there already, which simply doesn't scale. I did the math. It's 17 times the size of the current fossil fuel wow. industry, the entire global industry. They do about 80 million barrels of oil and gas per day today. So yeah, do 17, 18 times that just to sequester what we're already putting up there. And if you did that, you're still not taking anything out of the atmosphere that's already up there. Yeah, that's no, that's no good. And, and that's, that's the math from a guy that's pro super critical injection. Yeah. And it just, ah, when you hear from somebody like him, it, it's clear that it just will not scale. So there needs to be a different answer, but they're out there pushing it and people are listening because they have money to drive it and they're driving the research and they're trying to frame the research within their business models. It's a way to stay relevant. It's about money. Yeah, it makes it send that link. I, I'd like to see that. Um, the math is pretty compelling. It's, it's interesting to watch him kind of wiggle through it. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, I like those videos. They're fun. But um, yeah, I mean, I just wonder where it actually goes from there. Like, how do you, how do you achieve that if not? You don't, you don't. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, red carbon. I can sequester 60 gigatons a year relatively easily um, if I can get the carbon. <laughs> that part's a little harder. But once I get the carbon, assuming I can get it at scale, Here's what I need. And the, let's take the U.S., for example. I need okay. to do 20 10-acre sites, each U.S. state, 50 states. That's 1,000 sites per year, 10 acres each, three stories high. 
And all I'm doing is stacking carbon composite blocks. That's it. A carbon composite that I envision sequesters carbon above ground because it's non-biodegradable and non-photodegradable for a million years. Uh, Just putting it, the carbon, in a composite, which is a goo, it's a mixture, right? It's a, it's a liquid, you let it cure and it hardens, just like your, uh, your graphite tennis racket or your carbon fiber Lamborghini, right? It's got that really cool carbon fiber body. That material is non-biodegradable, non-photodegradable for a million years. So just make that material in, in the blocks and stack them and you've basically extra carbon. So why are we burying it two miles down? Uh, trillions of gallons a day, tens of trillions of gallons a day. It just, it'll never scale. I can do a thousand sites in the US, 20 per state, which is easy, 10 acres each, three stories. I can build one of those in probably a couple of weeks. Uh, that would sequester one gigaton in the U.S. each year. That's substantial. Yeah, uh, yeah, double the, the concentration of carbon in the blocks and uh, get 30 countries to do the same and you're sequestering 60 gigatons a year, which is matching the 40 that's already up there and you're taking about two, two and a half ppm per year out of the atmosphere. Jeez. So within within 30 years, I can get us down to 350. What's it's, the te what's the technology readiness looking like? Like how soon? Carbon composites are already a thing. You can already 3D print them. The challenge will be the material because uh, it needs to be a high enough concentration of carbon. And right now, carbon fiber is a low concentration of carbon, and it's also a process challenge. Carbon fiber, the way they make it, they use high heat uh, and carbon fibers. And the reason they do that is because the carbon fibers themselves are great at carrying weight uh, with low, I'm sorry, great at carrying load with low weight. So from a standpoint of strength versus weight, they're even stronger than steel. Uh, that's why they're used a lot in auto bodies for cars and airplane wings and stuff like that. They're really strong and they're really good at holding load and carrying weight and structural rigidity and that kind of stuff. But they're really lightweight. But it, you don't need that if you're just stacking blocks. Interesting. All you need is a higher concentration of carbon, which lowers the rigidity and the load bearing and all that stuff, which is important to a car company or a plane manufacturer, but it's something I don't really care about. So then it's re-envisioning the technology that already exists. So I'm early in the process, but sure. kind of tech is there and some guys are playing around with the electrical properties of a carbon composite block. They were looking, uh, KTH out of Sweden was looking with Volvo and Lamborghini and BMW and all the big auto manufacturers in Europe. They were looking at turning the EV body of a car made out of carbon fiber into a battery. So the body of your car is your battery. Yeah. Wow. That way you don't need a battery, which increases the weight of the car and uses up room. So why put a battery in a car if the body of the car can be the battery and then you don't need to displace uh, internal square footage for your passengers and you don't need to increase the weight of the car you just you use the fibers in the car as the battery so they spent a decade working on this stuff so the research has been ongoing and they spent millions of dollars on it uh, Lamborghini I posted it on the slack Lamborghini announced in partnership with MIT at the end of last year a new material based on a moth for uh, carbon composite battery and they increase the density by a hundred percent by using them all. Wow. And it's basically a carbon composite battery. So the technology is there, it's being optimized, it's early, but yeah, it's a material science challenge and then it's a scale challenge and I'm going to try and leverage the research that's already been done by all these guys. Wow. 
That's just how I just want to stack some blocks. <laughs> and if I can plug them into the grid and turn them into grid scale batteries, even better. Right, then, I yeah, paid, yeah. then I get paid twice, right? Sure. sure. Then, yeah. it's a, then it's a business model. Exciting. Cool. I'll let you get, man. Yeah, all right. Thanks you. So I'm glad you've been part of the channel. Good luck with your, uh, your DAC channel. And I owe you some research this weekend. I'll share with you what I can. Like I said, a lot of the research I do that I have in my own library is climate change research. Um, but I might be able to dust off a couple of articles that I've found over the years on uh, carbon capture stuff. Cool. I mean, I'm still happy to I'm still happy to look at the climate change research too. I mean, I'm always looking for new reading materials. So yeah, no, I I could send you yeah way too many articles. If you have anything cool, send them my way. Yeah, no, I've I've got some scary stuff. The compelling stuff I keep going back to, but yeah. normally the compelling stuff's pretty scary. So I don't want to I don't want to uh, I don't want to bum you out for the weekend. You got to see it sometimes. Get to the truth, see, uh, figure them out. Yeah, no, there's uh, there's two ways to look at it. You can either bury your head and pretend like it's not happening, or you can dive in and realize what the truth is and then try and do something about it. I'm, I'm someone from the latter camp. Yeah. I know a lot of people from the former camp, and it's risky even having these kind of conversations with those kind of folks, because when you do, it's... Yeah, it's interesting to watch how they respond. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I'll, 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 I'll send you some stuff. I have a, a one page uh, Word document with about 20 research articles that point you to even more research reports. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that'll, that'll get you going. Awesome. Thanks so much. See you. <laughs> See ya.